Hello once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial. What we're going to do in this one is some more Python actually. We're going to define an, or, or create another Python effector. And on this occasion what we've got, as, we can, as you can see, we've got a platonic object here, which I'm calling a ball, and we've got an array of what I'm calling cups down at the bottom. So I'm calling this one a cup and ball effector. What's going to happen? The ball here is a dynamic object, as of course are the cups. What's going to happen? This is going to drop down. It'll settle into one of the cups. The cup will then throw it up into the air. It'll come down again and settle into another cup, and the process will repeat itself. Now, I've also got, as you can see here, a cube, which I've basically resized uh, and set up as an object that can also be a collider for the, the ball, just in case it were to be thrown away from the, the actual board, as we might call all of this. Um, so that's just to stop that from happening. So what I'll do now, I'll just make that disappear because we don't really want to see it, but it's there so that it does that job. Okay, so from here, let's just have a quick look at how this has perhaps been built. We'll turn off the cloner and we'll turn off the surround around the, the array there. If we just select the cube, we can just see what's going on there. This is the cup, so we'll just have a quick look at the object. And it was just a cube object that I've fashioned into the shape of a, a kind of a, a, a square cup. Um, just simply by doing some extrusions and inner extrudes and just tugging a few vertices where, where need be. So that's all that is. So let's set everything back up and we'll take a look at what we can do from here. Okay, so we'll leave that set about there. So from here, let's go into the MoGraph and uh, grab a hold of a Python effector. We just should drop that onto the cloner. Just drop that in there. Okay, I'll just take it down to above the platonic. So what I'm going to do, I'll change my layouts to a coding layout, as I did with the last tutorial, if you've seen that one, hopefully you have. And just give myself a little bit more room in the bottom there in case I need it. And then from here, just open the code and go to full control, take away my loop, and execute and bring things back to where they need to be. Okay, so the first thing we need to do here is from Cinema 4D, C4D, import utils, because we are going to be using a range mapper in this, so it's going to be quite useful to have the utils in there now. Moving on from here, we don't need any other arrays. We've got the MAR array there, or the matrix array, that's fine. We've got our count values we had before. Um, we don't need to worry about the has field and the fall. We're not worried about those. We're not worried, we're not using fall offs or any or fields or anything like that. So we don't need to worry about them. We can just leave them there. First variable I, I need to define though is frame as I did last time. So frame is equal to doc get time get frame doc get FPS, open close and double close. So that sets up that first variable for us as we did before. Right, so moving on from here, we'll add some global variables. We just need three, so we're going to say global clone, global trigger, and finally global start time and you will see what these are for a bit later. Our next port of call is going to be to add some user data because we're going to need a couple of user data items. Um, so we'll get those done now. So the first one we're going to call object and that will be a link field. Where are we? There we go, link field. And the second one we're going to bring in a spline which we're going to be using a little bit later with a range mapper. So we'll say that's a spline and we'll just leave that at that, that's fine. So that brings those two in, that's great. First thing we can do is drag our platonic into the object field there and that will allow us to get that into the algorithm. And then we can say obj is equal to op user data number one. And then we may as well bring the spline in and say spline is equal to op user data number two. 
and that completes that little part of it. I'm also going to go down to the bottom now and say if frame, if I can spell it correctly, if frame is equal to zero, and I'm going to set these variables up now. So clone is equal to an empty list, and it will be the same for the other two. And start time. So that completes that little part of it. And now we've reached the point where we can define our function. And we only need one, so we can say trigger cup. And we'll start with a for loop. So for i in range. And we'll just say count. And we don't have to worry about taking off uh, a one from there. As we did in, our in my last tutorial, we needed to subtract one from count for what we were doing. On this occasion, we don't need to because we're simply going to be counting from naught to a, a hundred, uh, a hundred cups, basically a hundred clones. Uh, and the, for i is in, it will be in the range of count because it will go from naught to ninety nine. So that is in the range of a hundred clones. So you don't need to take off the one on this occasion. OK, and now we get to the part where we need to generate uh, a distance vector. Now, if you've seen any of Doa's tutorials uh, on, on Python effectors, um, what he calls reactors or responders, I believe he calls them, uh, you will know that we, or you may have, in fact, have already uh, generated one of these. We're going to generate a distance vector. Uh, and I must give a shout out to Doa for passing on that information because it's very, very useful. So many thanks, Doa. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's continue with this part of the actual algorithm. So we'll say that we want position, and that will be equal to, it'll be obj for object, dot get absolute position. And that will get the position of this object in the scene. And that's exactly what we want. We'll then use our loop so we can say that a difference vector, which is what we need first, is equal to ma square brackets i dot off for offset minus position. So we're getting the positions of all of our clones and we're subtracting the position of our object. OK, that's what we're doing here. And that gives us a difference vector, the difference between each of these locations and the location of our object. To finish it off, we need the distance between them. So what we do is say dist vex is equal to diff vect minus, I beg your pardon, not minus, get length, open close. And that will give us the length of each of the imaginary lines being generated between each of our clones and our object here. So that gives us a distance vector between each of these clones and our platonic object. And once again, thanks Doa for passing that on. It's such a useful piece of code. OK, now we need to start asking some questions. So we can say if distvect is less than or equal to 24. Now, what I'm saying then is once our object has dropped into a cup, its local axes will be less than 24 units away from the local axes of that particular clone. That's once it settles into a cup. So if we get that situation, then we do what we're going to do next. So we can then say, if len clone is less than one, clone dot append i. So once our cup has dropped, or once our ball, I should say, has dropped into a cup, we then can say if that's the case, if it's settled in and it's less than 24 units away from the cup, it's in exactly the right place that we needed to be for that for that cup to be triggered, 
for that clone to be triggered, we can then grab in that clone's index value because that will be the clone that we want to work with. That's what we're doing there. Moving on from here, we can then say if trigger, or rather len trigger, I should say, len trigger is less than one, trigger dot append, and I'm going to say one. I could say any value in there, but one is just fine. Uh, that's what it normally means true, so that's what we're going to say. And then finally, for this part of the algorithm, we can say if start time or like len start time start time is less than one start time dot append frame. So at this point, these hopefully you can see that the trigger and and the actual start time are kind of are they related to each other because what they're going to be used for is effectively a coded monoflop. So we're going to get the trigger in here, which is when the which which will actually set the monoflop in motion, and then the start time here is the start time that the monoflop will need as its point at which to start doing the do. Um, so that's what we've got those two variables in there for. Okay. So let's move on with that. So we can then say if trigger, or then again, then trigger, I should say, um, is equal to one. So if trigger has been triggered, um, we can then start looking at what we're going to do next. We can then say if duration, and this is just a local variable that I'm defining. So if duration, no, actually, I don't need to do that. I need to define it first. So I need to say duration is equal to. And this is going to be frame. So it's going to be the current frame of the timeline, wherever that happens to be, minus start time zero in, in square brackets. So what we're doing here, we've defined a local variable called duration, which, as you know, in the monoflop, there is a duration. It's equal to the current frame minus the start time. Well, the current frame and the start time are actually going to be exactly the same. So what we're saying here is set duration to zero, which is what we need to do. So uh, that's our starting point. So if, even if the the, if the, um, the timeline is, say, I don't know, 1400, we get, that, we get that frame into the start time and then subtract it from the current frame, which is still going to be 1400 from 1400. So that's it zeros it out for us. And it allows us to put zero at any point on the timeline so that that's where the monoflop can start working from a zero point, no matter where the timeline is. And that's really good. OK, so now we can say if duration is less than or equal to 29, and what we're saying here then is if our monoflop hasn't been working for longer than one second technically because we're going from naught to 29 frames, which is 30 seconds or 30 frames, which is one second, then we can say we'll use our range mapper. This is where we bring this in. So we can say range mapper is equal to C4D dot utils dot range map. Okay, so that brings in the range mapper from the utilities, which is up here. That's why we imported utils. That's where it's stored in that particular module. And then what we need to do is define its parameters. And you've, if you've used range mappers in uh, like Expresso, you'll know that there are a number of different parameters that you need to define. The first is to give it a value with which to control the range mapping, and that's going to be duration, so from 0 to 29. So we can put that in as our our, uh, our variable there, and also put 0, 29. We can then that's our output range. So that's or rather, sorry, that's our input range. That's that defined. Our next port of call is to define the output range. Well, all of our clones start at a point of zero, a zero point of origin, but they need to raise about 20 units. So we can say zero. Of a 20. 
so that's our output range. Moving on from here, we can add the word true. You can put true or false at this position. And true simply means that these values are restricted to these values. They can't go above or below. So you can't go below 0 or above 29. And similarly with the output range, it restricts them. Otherwise, if you put false in there, then they can go beyond these numbers should you need them to. Same as exactly the same as with the range mapper in Expresso. And then finally, we've got the optional spline again, which is the same thing with the Expresso. You can check the box there to use the spline or you can uncheck it. We're going to use it because we brought it in. So we can put spline in there and then that's going to use this. So now would be a good point to actually set it up with some knots. So let's just add those. So the first one we're going to start at zero, zero. And next one we're going to move on to this. We're going to, it's going to be zero on the Y and we're going to say that it's going to be 0.35 on our uh, Y scale there or our X scale, I should say. So that's that one defined. Let's just go back a minute. I think I've just moved that, haven't I? Or have I? No, it's the three five, it is there. Okay, so that's fine. Let's add another one. We'll take this right up to the top and that's going to be 375 on the X axis. So it's gonna be a sharp rise. It's gonna jump, the, the, the cups are gonna leap up like jack in the boxes and that's what we want. It's gonna give us a nice, a nice reaction there. And then our next knot we can, place at the top or, or one on point Y and we can also place it at 0.65 on the X axis. And then we just have one final knot to do and this goes at zero on the Y and one at the X. And then we can look at perhaps adjusting our tangents a little bit on these. We're gonna say um, minus one, two, five, I think is pretty good for that. And we'll do the same with that one. We'll just set these to one, two, five, and they'll be both the same. And that will give us a nice smooth return. So it's gonna be a very sharp rise, a pause, and then a nice smooth return back to the zero position. So that should look quite nice. Okay, moving on from here, we have to convert a vector value to real values, um, which we'll see why as we go along. But what we're gonna say is X, is equal to, and then we're going to say ma clone zero double close dot off dot x. So we're getting the position of our clone that we're working with. We're going to get its x position. That's what we want first. Its y position is going to be our range mapper because that's going to be moving it up and down. And finally, its z position, the same as with the x. We just copy this, paste it in here, and say dot z. So we've got our vector values, or our vector values for our chosen clone, and we've converted them to real values, x, y, and z. Okay, that's so that we can incorporate the range mapper into y. That's what we're doing here. And then finally, what we need to say is ma clone zero double close dot off is equal to c four d dot vector brackets x comma y comma z to convert the real values back to a vector value exactly the same as saying reals to vector in expresso is precisely the same so we're getting the offset we're, we're working with the offset of the clone so we need to offset its height which we're going to do with the range mapper. That's exactly why we've done this. Okay, so that's all good. And then the next port of call, or the final port of call for us really, is where we've got um, duration at the top here. We've got if duration, blah, blah, blah. Now, another thing we need to do also is just indent those because that's not correct. They weren't at the correct indentation. They do need to be part of this if. Okay, so now what we need to do is say else. And then once this cycle has been completed, we can reset our clone, our trigger, and our start time ready for the next clone. So to do that, we simply say delete or del delete clone square brackets. 
and just put a colon in there. Do the same with the trigger. And finally, the start time. Let's get that there. Okay, and that's that done. So everything is ready to, to actually start a game when the next clone is called. And that's all there is to it. That's the function. That's the function that we need to use to actually make all of this happen. So to finish off, all I need to say here is else call the function. So it's trigger underscore cup. Open close brackets. And there it is. That's your that's your thing set up. So let's well let's just see if it works. There's probably some errors in it, but well, they never know. I shouldn't really say that. There might not be, but we'll see if there are. Anyway, let's just see what happens. Ah, it works. And there you go. As you can see, it's very dynamic and it's quite quite an impressive, uh, impressive little setup, really. Quite fun to do. <laughs> yeah, it works pretty well, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of fun. So let's have a quick recap then. We imported our utils, um, which we needed because, of course, we needed to use a range mapper a little bit later on. We set up a variable for our frames to get frames from the timeline, um, which we usually need to when we're working with anything that uses time. We set up some global variables for a clone, trigger, and start time, which again we use in our monoflop range mapper setup and then we created our function and we used a little bit of code up the top here to get the, the distance vector between our object and any of our given clones and we then check the length of that distance vector and if it was found to be less than 24 units we know that the ball is occupying that particular cup and we know that that cup needs to be triggered so we get the cups index value because that's the cup we're going to be working with. We set the trigger and we set the start time and the trigger is set to one and start time is set to the current frame. We then say if our trigger has been triggered, so if it's if its length is one, we set our duration which is the current frame minus the start time giving us a value of zero and then we start looking at what's happening next. So we then start counting between our, our frame our current frame and our start time. So as our as our frames increase, of course, we get to the value of 29. But over that period of, of time, we're actually using our range mapper to actually move our Y position of our clone and bring it up in the air. And, and, and we're using the actual spline over here to make this happen in a really quite dynamic and interesting way, quite a mechanical way, I suppose we can say. Once the cycle's been completed, we just delete everything that we were using here, these three, and they're ready to go when the next clone is triggered or when it, when it needs to be triggered. And down at the bottom here, we've just said, if frame is equal to zero, set our clones, clone trigger and start time lists up as empty lists. And then at any other time, we're just triggering the cup. We're just running our function to make it all happen. And that's essentially all there is to it. So, uh, yeah, have fun with it. See what you you know, just have a good play around with it. See if you can do anything else. Maybe you can have two objects in the scene and work out a way to do two things being thrown around at the same time. Maybe you could have a, I don't know, a, a blue ball and a red ball. <laughs> Maybe you could do something like that. But um, yeah, I mean, have a play with it. See what you think. But that's all there is to it. So I hope you've enjoyed this one, and that uh, again, it's perhaps inspired you a bit to give this a another another go with with something else see if you can do a little bit more with it but uh anyway that's about it for now so i'll see you very soon on the next one